Hello everybody and welcome to Solano College Sports Network for a brand new edition of On Campus. I'm your host Cameron Anderson here with a very special guest of mine, the superintendent here at Solano Community College, Dr. Celia Esposito Noy. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great, thanks for having me. So I first want to start off diving into a little bit about your background and some things that you could maybe inform us on, the, the audience and myself, getting to know you a little bit, maybe some early education, your journey, and just a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Well, I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, it's hard to leave the Bay Area once you grow up there. Um, and most of my high school time was spent doing musical theater and um, music. And um, that was sort of the plan that everybody thought that I might go into music, as many of my friends did. Um, but that really wasn't something that I thought about. And so I um, ended up going to San Francisco State for my undergraduate degree. Uh, I declared my major the day I filed my papers for graduation. Not necessarily the best advice we give students, but it worked out for me because I spent each semester really exploring different majors, understanding what my strengths and interests were. Uh, so I graduated from the College of Ethnic Studies with a Black mm. Studies degree from San Francisco State University. And so when students ask, you know, what can you do with an Ethnic Studies degree, I always say anything and everything. Mm. Because it really was a true liberal arts undergraduate education. So that's where I started um, and I had planned to go to law school. Uh, I was student body president at San Francisco State. I worked with the statewide California State Student Association, which is the lobbying body for the CSUs. Uh, everybody in that group was all going to law school. Hmm. And I remember thinking that there are some laws that for me were unethical and I couldn't uphold those. And so I thought, I don't think that law school is going to be a good choice for me. And when did you think about getting into becoming a superintendent? Obviously, you had you worked some you worked at other places in the community college system. When did you think? Well, first talk maybe a little bit about that experience, mm -hmm. and then when you thought that being a superintendent was plausible. Well, I loved being a college student. I loved being on a college campus. It really was life changing. Um, but one of my first jobs was as the tutoring center supervisor at Chabot College in Hayward. Mm -hmm. And I really did not have any experience with the community college system, um, but they hired me there and I had a great experience and it was during that time that I decided to do a master's degree in administrative policy analysis in higher education. So I got into Stanford, I did a one year program, uh, I worked on campus, I produced a, a master's thesis on um, undergraduate experience in um, ethnic theme houses. This is 1992, 93. Wow. Um, I had a great experience there. Um, I also took third year law class while I was there. Uh, I was a teaching assistant for a political science class. So I really had this really robust college experience also as a graduate student. And that really was sort of the experience that solidified for me that I wanted to stay working in higher education. So um, I'd had a great experience at Chabot. Uh, after graduate school, I did work at a private university as a dean, and I also taught there. But I knew I always wanted to come back to community college because I knew how life-changing community colleges were for students, and really for those of us who work here as well. So came back in and have been back in the system since 1998. Mm. And when did you get here at Solano to become the superintendent? I started here in January of two, 2016. Okay. Uh, the year before I served as a vice chancellor down at the Chabot Las Positas district okay. where I had started. Right. Uh, and prior to that I had been vice president in Sacramento. I had done an interim presidency. I was a dean. Um, I've been adjunct faculty at Chabot for a while. Mm -hmm. So I've worked in a lot of different positions in the system, which I think is a great way to prepare to become a president. Right, and that makes sense. What, what was it about Solano that intrigued you most in this opportunity? Well, you know, I drove past this college for 15 years, mm -hmm. from Vallejo to Sacramento. Right. And I never once thought, hmm, there's a job opening at Solano mm -hmm. um, because at the time the reputation was not all that outstanding mm. 
and it was sort of the college that you drove past. And I thought, you know, when the opening became available, I think it was in 2015, I said, this is the college that's in my community, mm -hmm. and I think I have skills that would help really highlight all that this college is possible. You know, what's possible here, what we can do here, how we can grow, how we become really not just, you know, the, the best kept secret in Solano County, but the jewel of Solano County, mm -hmm. and how we can contribute to advancing the workforce, de work development, and improving students' lives so that this isn't just, you know, a fallback option, but it's the first choice right. for college. So for me, this was a place that had the right people at mm -hmm. the right time who wanted to do something different. And I think my skill set matched with what the college wanted to do. So this was the only college I've ever applied for a presidency. <laughs> and as I've said to the board, I'd like to finish my career here as well, because this has been a phenomenal place. Well, that's fantastic to hear. And so what were your initial thoughts as being the superintendent? Was it more or less stressful than what you thought? Were the expectations exceeded or met? Or how? what were your first thoughts and sort of how has it been in terms of what you expected coming into the job? Well, I knew we'd have to do some cleanup, and um, that's okay, right? I, I like to clean. Um, I think there's a healthy part of cleaning up an organization, mm -hmm. asking people to step in to identify what things haven't been working. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time doing that. And the fact that people were willing and able and wanted to clean some things up, and I mean like policies, procedures, how we do business, um, all of that was really important. And when folks were like, yeah, we need to do that, that gives us the space then to make those improvements and make those changes. Um, beyond that, really my job has been to say yes and let's figure out how. Mm. And, and that's really what I think you do as a superintendent president. It's not blocking people, it's not saying no, we can't do this, it's clarifying that we have resources identifying what those resources are, and then aligning those resources w with the activities that folks want to put into place to create a phenomenal experience for students. And that's what we've been able to do. So as sort of a, a jack of all trades, you've, done, you've worked a lot of jobs, and obviously you attest that to the great experience, and that's helped you so much in being superintendent. What would you say to maybe a, a college student who is maybe just graduating or just getting into college and they have some sort of idea of what they want to do in the real world in terms of a career, but maybe they bounce around a couple places and they can't really find their way immediately out of the gate. Yeah. You know, you have to go with what you feel passionate about and you have to understand what your strengths are. And because then you look for career opportunities and job opportunities where you can align your strengths with what an organization needs. So, you know, the whole thing about you have to pick a major, that's not necessarily the position I come from. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of you have to pick a passion, something that you love doing, where you feel like you can make a contribution, and where you have the skill sets that align with the organization, with what they need at that point in time. You know, I won't always be the right person to lead this college. At some point, the college will need something different. And I think that's something we have to be mindful about even when we're starting out in our career, mm -hmm. is that sometimes we, we outlive our utility and we need to move on. Or an organization changes and we need to move on. And that's okay. I want to ask a little bit about some hobbies of yours. I know in the, in the last episode that you were here in 2017, uh, I, think, I believe Majnik Anderson conducted the interview yes. and she did a fantastic job. You talked a little bit about some hobbies, but I'm interested if you developed maybe any new hobbies in the last five years. You know, there's been some, some changes that have happened in the world, or maybe just some of the similar hobbies that you've had for quite some time now. I used to play tennis more often than I do now. Okay. So, um, sort of put that on the back burner for a while. Yeah. Um, I did try pickleball. Oh, yeah. And an hour worth of pickleball, I had more aches and pains than I did in 50 <laughs> years of playing tennis. So, I don't know if I'm going to take up pickleball right away. Um, hobbies right now, I'm, you know, I'm caring, helping to care for my mom, who's mm -hmm. elderly and, and lives near the college. 
Um, I've got a granddaughter who's in college as a nursing major. Um, hobbies right now are limited mm -hmm. um, because we really were trying to all get through COVID and I really wanted to be able to focus my attention on caring for the folks here, right. the college, the students, and, and then being able to take care of my family as well. Um, at some point, I think I'll take up tennis again. I know we've talked about pickleball here. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if I'm going to be able to do pickleball again. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a superintendent, obviously, I mean, both of my parents are teachers, so I'm used to that summer off and sort of we have similar schedules because once I'm in school and once summer happens, we usually all together as a family have that time off. But it must be a little different as a superintendent and having to monitor a college really 365 days a year. Maybe talk to me a little bit about how life looks like for you in the summertime. Yeah, well, we, you know, oftentimes folks will say, oh, it must be nice when the summer's slow. And I've said, summers are never slow. They are a brief period of time in which you try to accomplish everything that you put off in May. Mm. And then next thing you know, August is here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, the schedule that we live under mm -hmm. now um, for colleges, there is no more slow time. We are constantly moving. And whether it's finishing up from a previous semester or getting ready for the next semester, um, there's work to be done. Um, part of my contract is that I'm available 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I commit to doing that. Um, so that if I'm on vacation, folks know how to reach me. Um, I take calls. We have a great team of managers here, so when I am gone, they handle things, which makes my life a lot easier. Um, but yeah, life is a little different um, from when you're a student or a faculty member and you have that time to really reflect and um, restore your energy. Rest of us are here trying to just sort of finish up what we didn't do in May and get ready for August. Well, speaking of life being a little different, I mean, it's definitely been a little different lately. Obviously, a lot has happened within the last five years since you've, since you've been here, primarily, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic. Take me through a little bit of what was going on in your mind as the superintendent of a college in March 2020. <laughs> well, I do remember that date very well. Uh, we were having our board meeting that day when Solano County declared state of public emergency. Mm -hmm. Um, I had been speaking with um, the County Office of Education, anticipating that this was coming. Uh, we were watching other counties shut down, Sonoma and Napa, so we weren't completely surprised. The irony, of course, is that we said, oh yeah, we'll see you all in a couple weeks. Right. Um, and so no one really was prepared for the length of time that we spent um, getting through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, we were very intentional in how we approached the pandemic. Um, immediately when the county closed down, we said, we've got to get folks moved online. Let's make sure faculty get the training and resources. Let's make sure students get training and resources. So you may recall, we, we actually didn't offer classes for about four or five days just to focus on training mm. and then get folks on board, uh, online, move as much as we could. There were some programs that we couldn't move to online, and that right. was not because we couldn't, it was because accrediting agencies, um, state agencies didn't allow for it. Mm. So we had to get creative on that. Um, but one of the things that we decided we would not do is get into the political battle about you know, requiring vaccinations. Mm -hmm. I was watching what was happening at other colleges. They were spending all of their time defending their decisions and they couldn't focus on moving to an online format for faculty and students. And our main interest here was let's get everybody back in the classroom so that folks can finish their program. So we said, take all the precautions, necessary health precautions. And I'm happy to say we did not have one out break attributed to Solano College during the two and a half, three years that COVID was in place. Wow. Do you think that in some ways moving to an online curriculum benefited Solano in some cases? Absolutely. Before we moved to the pandemic and to online, students had asked, how come you don't have more online classes? Mm. 
How come you don't have online services? So for us, this was a great opportunity to move to an online format, both for instruction and for student services. Uh, the faculty were incredible how they pivoted, uh, really, four or five days into these online settings. Students, their ability to pivot and move to an online format. Our student services improved their delivery, completion rates, responses to phone calls, emails. Uh, we don't have students coming to campus to wait in line for two hours for an appointment. Mm. That's, that's all handled now remotely. So the nice part is this gave us an opportunity to respond to what students have been asking for. More online classes and more online services. And we have done that. So now, a little over three years later, I believe in the fall, there should be full faculty on campus. I know there are still some faculty members that have been just online for the last couple of years, even with a lot of classes slowly moving to in-person. Mm -hmm. what, what are you most looking forward to for that aspect of faculty being on campus again in the fall? Well, early on, I encouraged folks to come to campus because the longer you stayed away, the harder it would be to come back. Yeah. So during the pandemic, I was on campus five days a week. Mm. I like to work here, and I wanted to be here, and I wanted to be able to make sure I understood what was happening on campus. So what we're doing is there will still be online classes because students fill online sections first, and there will be in-person classes. Um, we will have, as we've been having, staff will be in person and online, available Zoom for appointments and services. So what we've done is really say we've heard students what they prefer, we want to meet those interests, and at the same time, we want folks to be back on campus to enjoy really what is a vibrancy that we have here that you can't replicate in an online format. So there will be folks, more folks here on campus, might not be every day of the week, but more folks will be here on campus. We'll have a lot more activities happening. And I think the students will just begin to feel a real sense of um, presence by the faculty and staff and other students here on campus and know that we're still available online and you can still have the in-person experience. Well, speaking of that in-person experience, I'm curious to hear some of your, your visions or plans in the near future to add to more on-campus culture as more students and faculty members are returning to in-person classes. What are some of the things maybe in the works to look forward to? <laughs> well, we have what we've been referring to as Central Bark, right, mm. that quad area, right. and everybody want to know what we're doing with that. Well, we surveyed students and employees, and we got well over a thousand responses. We now have these five main themes um, of activities that we are going to put into a plan in the quad. Mm. So starting in the fall when we start actually working on the quad, students will see areas designated for table tennis, cornhole, uh, maybe a yoga class. Students will see designated areas where they can sit and study and gather under shaded trees. Um, Everything will have a plug-in for your phone, so you can charge your phones while you're outside. Um, we're gonna be doing all of that, finalizing the quad plans in the next few weeks, mm. and then we will start that project. And that's one of the ways in which we're going to get more folks to stay on campus, because mm -hmm. things are gonna be happening out there. Right. In addition, we're gonna be adding um, a position, um, a director of student engagement. So someone who's primary role will be to plan, schedule, recruit, provide these great opportunities for students to, to have a good time here on campus. You know, we, we heard from students, even during the pandemic, who said, there's still a vibrancy here. Mm -hmm. we, you know, it's great to see people on campus, but we'd like to see more activities. So we've heard students and we're gonna be doing that. The other big project we have that I'm excited about is the student housing. Yep. So. Um, we are submitting our application to the state in July. Uh, that is for particular, uh, it's called SB 169 funding that would mm. provide rooms for students who are taking 12 units or more. Now that's not all of our students and we know that. Yeah. So we are also looking at a, what we call a P3, public-private partnership, mm. where we could build housing that would support 
students who have families, who have dependents, who can't take 12 units, but need affordable housing here on campus. So that's where we are right now. We'll be submitting our proposal in July. And based on what the state does or doesn't do, then we may move to our next phase of housing. But we will have student housing on this campus. And I think that is going to completely change the student experience. I would 100% agree with that. I've always been curious about the, the on-campus housing situations. Mm -hmm. where, where do you think the on-campus housing would be? So the space that we've designated yeah. is the grassy area between the soccer pitch and the softball stadium. Got it. Yeah. And it's near all the athletic facilities. Mm -hmm. There's an easy corridor into the campus. There's parking out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just today looked at some renderings that we will be sharing with the board in May. Um, and then once the board approves that, we will be excited to share that with everyone. It's, it's a really incredible opportunity for students to live on campus, build community within um, residence halls. And then we're gonna focus on residential education. So it's not just a dorm experience. It's where students have learned skills, they learn how to um, manage conflict, um, right. where they'd have an opportunity to maybe even have classes held in there. I'm curious, there's obviously a lot to look forward to and a lot on your plate, it seems consistently. What is a daily life look like for you as a superintendent? What, what, how do you, and I'm also curious to uh, the second the follow-up question is, how do these plans and visions sort of process and go through in a timely fashion that you're hoping for? So the daily life changes, which makes this job so fun, is that there is no day that's the same. Uh, the month of May is nonstop events, mm -hmm. and, and we just try to figure out how many of the events can you be at? Mm -hmm. Who's going to go and represent? So we make sure that we do that because we value the work that faculty and staff are doing to honor students, and so we want to be there. So that that that's that's one of the challenges in the month of May. Um, but some days, you know, it's it's focusing on issues that aren't so wonderful. Um, when I first got here, I think in the first year, one of the students on our tennis team passed away. Mm -hmm with the other tennis players at the beach, and I made a call to that parent. Um, I was always hopeful that I would never have to do that again. Those, those are some difficult conversations to have with parents. Some days we have great things happening here, like when we host the U.S. Tennis Association Pro Challenger event that brings us international attention, yeah. you know? And so you have to be present for that as well. So, so that can be challenging. Um, I think, you know, what, what, what's coming up is we still have outstanding programs. I'm hoping that more and more potential students will look at our programs, think about being here, that they feel welcomed on campus, they mm -hmm. feel like they belong, and that they find support among the faculty and staff and other students to be here, to be successful, and to really ask us to help them along the way in their journey. So that's what I'm hoping will be happening in the, in the next few years as well. And then we're going to be growing and changing based on sort of what are the needs of students, what are some of the programs that we need to add, uh, and where do we want to focus our attention. Well, speaking on attention and some new programs, I believe there's a, a new grant that was given to the school on I believe what's called the, the MESA yes. STEM, STEM program. Do you yes. want to talk a little bit about that? Are you sure. excited about that? Yeah, I am, because we used to have that here uh, several years ago, but we had folded it in with a, a federal program called TRIO. And the feds came over and said, you can't do that anymore. Um, also at that time, TRIO money from the federal government was very prescriptive, and we could not serve all of our students, in particular mm -hmm. our students who were undocumented. And I said to the board and to the college, I said, I'm not interested in eliminating students from participating because the feds don't support this. We will do this on our own. And so we did. We gave back the last year of federal funds. Mm -hmm. MESA has undergone some changes. It's a statewide program. They asked us to apply. And so we have done that. And so we're working right now on getting uh, folks hired. As director, we're looking at what the role will be for faculty, 
We already have a really strong math and science program. Uh, we have a med school pathway program that is outstanding. Um, that's being managed by a lot of our faculty in uh, physiology and anatomy. We have a partnership with Kaiser Vallejo where students will get to do public health research in the summer. Mm. One of our students who was part of that program, he's now at Michigan State Med School. Wow. Uh, so, so we have that coming down the pike and I think with those MESA dollars, we'll be able to um, share with students, here are some opportunities for you. You may think that you're not good in math and science, but let's look at what are some options for you. Public health is an area. We found out how important that was during the pandemic. So we want to introduce students to different majors, career opportunities through MESA while also ma remaining focused on you know, STEM. Right. So before we, before we wrap up here, I have one last question, and I'm interested to see, hear your thoughts on maybe looking back, reflecting on your time here at Solano, what, do you, what have you been most proud of? What have you, in terms of coming into the situation that you were given and uh, through your body of work, what, what would you say you're most proud of being here at Solano? I think the climate and culture that we have built together is quite impressive, and we've done it in a very short period of time. Um, you know, oftentimes students don't understand how important it is to have a healthy rapport and relationship between administration and faculty and staff, because that informs the student experience. And so one of the first things that I wanted to do was really talk about building a healthy culture and climate here, where we respect each other, and that that becomes evident to students, because I always say about students, be nice to them because one day they'll be your boss. Right. And I actually have a former student who could potentially be my boss in the very near future. Um, and so for me, it's important that we model for students what collegial, healthy, mm -hmm. working relationships look like so that you all can take that with you as part of your learning experience. Well, that's awesome and great to hear. And thank you so much, Celia, for sitting down thank to me. This is a huge honor being able to talk to you. Thank you. Um, and that's going to be all for us here on this edition of On Campus here on the Solano College Sports Network. I'm Cameron Anderson. This is Celia Esposito Noy, and thank you all for watching. We'll catch you next time.